Welcome everyone to our presentation today on environmental monitoring using Earth observation and augmented reality. Just a reminder, there's a live Q&A going on throughout the presentation, so please feel free to ask questions throughout and we will be here monitoring and answering your questions. And also, there is a survey at the end of the presentation which we would really appreciate if you could fill out. So we'll start quickly with some introductions. So my name is Matt Murdoch. I'm a professional engineer since 2008, and I'm a senior program manager working at Earth Daily managing software programs. Today, I have my colleague, Will Parkinson, who has his master's in science, and he is a technical product manager here presenting as well. Earth Daily Analytics is headquartered in Vancouver, BC, and we're using an Earth observation image to show where we're located just around the convention center you can see. We are a software and analytics space company developing world first technologies in data services, satellite processing and machine learning based solutions using Earth observation data. And now I'll turn it over to Keith to introduce himself. Hey everyone, it's Keith Lay from Cleario. I'm the director of content at Cleario here in Vancouver. And uh, we've created an app suite uh, that basically allows people an end to end uh, tool to create share and manage their spatial and 3D data that they create in the field and share back with experts at the office. Really happy to be uh, joining the presentation today and look forward to showing you uh, some of our augmented and virtual reality technologies later on. Back to Matt. Thanks, Keith. And I'll quickly go over the agenda. First, we're gonna talk about the learning objectives we want everyone to get out of this presentation today. Then we're gonna give you an overview of different Earth observation data types, talk about when and how to use the different data types, talk about some of the challenges of using EO data, and then a solution around using Earth Mosaic system, which is, we'll get into more details, but it's like an image composite. And then we'll show how data visualization using augmented reality that Keith just mentioned can be used to show off the data. And then we'll focus on some real life engineering case studies, bringing all this technology together. So today, the learning objectives we'd like people to walk away with today is we want you to have a better understanding of the differences between LIDAR, SAR, which is synthetic aperture radar, and optical remote sensing data, and when and what to use for environmental monitoring. Understand the benefits of large image composites that use earth observation processing technology. Learn what products can be used for which types of environmental monitoring, specifically monitoring change. And understanding how cloud-based advanced processing enables new applications for earth observation environmental monitoring. And then finally, have a better understanding how to communicate geodata in an augmented reality environment. And now I'll turn it over to Will. Thanks, Matt. Um, yes, I am Will Parkinson, and my background is in remote sensing science. Uh, and so what I want to do with these next few slides is just, just do a crash course in what Earth observation broadly is so that we're all on the same page uh, so we can talk about some solutions within the, the geoscience space. So broadly speaking, what is remote sensing? Remote sensing is the act of measuring things from afar. Uh, the most obvious example we all know well is our eyes which is why we use them all the time in various capacities and, they're, and it's part of just how the natural world works. And so what we're doing with technology is measuring these things from afar and that manifests in all kinds of different ways now from space-based systems to airborne systems to our cell phones to all kinds of lab-based equipment. And all of these are doing this technology of measuring light in various capacities. Sometimes that light is emitted from a source so that we can understand it and characterize that response. Another, and other times that light is emitted from sources like the sun, which means we also need to understand the sun in order to understand the light we're measuring. And so if we're doing things in a natural system, it does, it, it's, it's all about measuring light with respect to the earth and how light travels through the atmosphere. And so we have on the screen here, just a very basic uh, map of atmospheric opacity, or just another way to look at how easily different energies of light travel through the atmosphere. And what it what it visualizes very quickly is 
that a lot of different types of light are, are absorbed by the atmosphere at different areas. And that directly impacts how we make measurements and the types of technology that we can deploy in different contexts. And in a very, very broad stroke, we can just say these are broadly our observation windows. These areas of light that have some opacity to be able to get through are what we're able to measure with light. Uh, some of this we know well, such as the visible spectrum, uh, and then, then it goes all the way out into the radio waves and various other electromagnetic waves. We're not going to dive deep into what electromagnetic waves are and the actual technologies they're in. Here we're just going to talk about the broad overview of different sensor types and how they apply to different platforms. Within the geoscience space, these two technologies, synthetic aperture radar and light detection and ranging or LIDAR, are probably some of the most popular remote sensing uh, methods used. Uh, synthetic aperture radar uses an active uh, sensor technology where it, it shoots a beam of light uh, using a variety of techniques to measure the ground, and then it measures that response. At its core, it's able to measure uh, surface roughness, as well as electrochemical properties of that surface, which is very different than taking a picture, say, with optical data, which we'll talk about in a second. And it also has other properties because of the wavelengths it uses and the nature of that technology, is it allows us to understand how the topography of the land is changing over time. And that's using a technology called interferometric SAR. On the right side, uh, we have LiDAR data, and it's used in a number of contexts, especially in an airborne and terrestrial comp, uh, context. On the left image here, you see a quick colorized image of a LiDAR data set over a forested area with likely some water in the blue areas. And on the right, you see a terrestrial-based LiDAR data set, which is able to characterize the, the ground as well as the features surrounding uh, the road in this context, more trees and things like this. And they are used in all kinds of places, such as survey, to understanding how uh, and characterizing forest inventories, to understanding how the landscape is changing year over year over year. Now, the technology that I'm most familiar with and I spend most of my time on is a, is passive earth observation technology, which is is Passive is, is quite literally, it's, it's not providing its own source of illumination. So in this case, we're talking about measuring the sun. And what we do is we measure different wavelengths of the optical spectrum of light and, and those different colors uh, tell us different properties. So in this image here, this is a very basic and old image from, from Landsat, I think in oh, 1980 or so, just showing a brief overview of all the different basic colors they're using then. So we have red, green, blue, near infrared, shortwave infrared, one and two, and then thermal. And the reason we measure all these different colors is really about understanding and measuring different properties of the Earth's surface in different modalities or, or light. Uh, and that's easier, uh, easier to see in the next slide I'll use. Here is an image of a true and a false color composite. So again, we're looking at the same data sets we just looked at. And depending on how we bring these colors together, that tells us different things about the landscape. Uh, at a very basic level, you can see on the left image, which is again, a true color image, you can see the cloud plume uh, from likely a fire happening in the Northeast of the image. And you can't even see that as well in the near infrared. You can see it a little bit, but not as strongly. And that just shows you also that atmosphere changes how it inter interacts with light depending on the, the properties of, of what it's traveling through and the light that we're looking at. At, at Earth Daily Analytics, we use this sort of capacity of measuring light over time to do all kinds of, of analytics on understanding vegetation and vegetation health over time. Uh, in our agricultural work, this is some images from that, we are able to use uh, those properties to build vegetation indexes, they're called, and we measure these over time, and they'll help us understand how different farm fields are doing, how fields are doing relative to fields in the region, how entire regions are going, doing, sorry, and then, and then up to how even the entire globe is doing with respect to vegetation productivity. Now, these, these were all a uh, quick casting of all the different sensors at play. Uh, what sensors are mounted on platforms. And so how we bring technologies together for us is really about how do you, what platform is appropriate for the sensor that you're using. And broadly speaking, it can go all the way down from, if we were to go even further 
uh, down the, the line on drones. That could be things like Internet of Things, but drones on the left all the way to high orbit satellites. And each platform has its advantages. High orbit satellites give you a, a, a strong capacity to dwell and look at the landscape over, over long periods of time, especially if it's a geosynchronous one. Uh, and then slightly lower orbits will allow you to do things like have lots of revisit and, and measure vast quantities of land. The lower you get to Earth, the less land you can measure at once, but you can get higher, higher resolutions typically. And so you have this big trade space between platforms, resolution, and how much you're trying to cover based on use case. And in the world of remote sensing, there is this growing and pressing need for global monitoring. Many of the greatest challenges that we're facing today require more and more measurements from space. And the reason for this is because as the landscape changes, both due to uh, natural and non-natural or anthropogenic effects, this has a direct impact on how we manage our systems, the nature of the geohazards at play, uh, and, and overall health and long-term trajectory of ecosystems. However, when people work with data, typically in our domain, it can be often very hard to use. Common things we've heard uh, working with various customers in various industries is things such as, I've bought this data, but I'm not sure how to use it. It's too hard to find the data I'm looking for, even though I know it must exist. How do I know what data I really want? I'm not sure how to work with it. How do I even manage all this data? And this data just costs too much, both to buy and to store. And these are some of the core challenges that really hold using Earth observation a lot of the time. And I'm going to hand it back to Matt. Thank you, Will. And now I'm going to talk about some of the challenges with managing Earth observation data. It can be very expensive, as Will mentioned, and also it can it be hard to find. But one of the great things that's happened in the last number of years is we now use the cloud for almost all EO data these days. But the big challenge is optimizing the costs in the cloud because it can be easy to put it there, but it can be hard to do it in a costly manner. It can easily cost millions of dollars a year just for a single mission, just to store data. And an example I like to give at Earth Daily Analytics in the early days when we were new to the cloud, we were competing with Netflix Canada as one of the top uh, cloud users in all, all of Canada. And that's not something you want to do as a startup company. So we learned our lesson pretty hard, but it also got us really looking at how can we really optimize our cloud usage, you know, based on our customer needs. And what you can do in the cloud is you can essentially scale up infinitely. So if you have a customer that needs a ton of data um, right away, you can scale up from one to thousands of processors and essentially process, process that data right away and get it to them very quickly. Now that does come with a cost. And you can see on the bottom right, we have this sort of latency dial. The quicker it is, generally the more expensive it costs. And the slower it is, generally the less it costs. And so really it's about doing it in a way that you can satisfy both needs. If you have somebody that needs it and is willing to pay more for it right away, it can be available. But if you have somebody that doesn't need it right away, you provide low cost ability so companies and end users can do it in a cost efficient way. And this is probably one of the bigger challenges going forward is, is how do you optimize this? And more and more data is coming online. At Earth Daily Analytics, we are launching the Earth Daily Constellation at the end of 2023. And what this is, is a 10 satellite a constellation that's going to image the entire land mass plus some maritime areas on a daily basis. And you can see on the right in the video is just hoovering up all of the land mass on a daily basis. And this is going to open up so many different opportunities for monitoring change on a daily basis. So monitor very small change and see how it changes every day. And with that, there's a lot of colors that are available to distinguish between different land cover types. So this satellite uh, constellation includes 22 spectral bands, and we'll explain a little bit about how this works and we're going everywhere from the visible to the thermal bands. So we can measure things like methane, or we can measure things like how hot things are to measure forest fires. But with this comes with a lot of data. So there's about 20 terabytes a day downlink a day, and then there's once you downlink it and create 
end products for the user, the data kind of multiplies. So you really need to do this in a very efficient way in order to have a business and provide value and allow this as a tool for people to use. So what we're doing Earth Daily Analytics is one of our specialties is in processing this data. So once the data comes down from the satellite, it's downlinked to a ground station around the world and you get this raw downlink data that you see on the left. So this is all these different spectral bands, you know, attempted to um, put on top of each other, but there's all sorts of color issues here. The, the bands aren't aligned. You can't really use this data. And so what we do is take that data, automatically process it into what we call analytics ready data. And then that can then be fed into applications. And you can see in the analytics ready data, we can mark clouds, you can see fields, the, accuracy, the, the location and the colors are very, very accurate. And we can scale this up to 20 terabytes a day or down to a, you know, hundreds of megabytes a day. And we only use what we need within the cloud. So that's kind of the ideal scenarios if you do that. And then once you have analytics ready data, there's a lot of different things you can do with it. And we, uh, the presenters here, worked on a collaborative project called the Satellite Based Environmental Analytics Project. And this is what spurred this whole presentation. And it's a project that just ended in July and it went for about two years and was funded by the Digital Technology Supercluster. And what we did is we took that analytics ready data and, and created what we call image composites or mosaics. And Will's gonna go into more detail exactly what those are. Um, and these are large scale images that cover country scale, province size, so all of BC, and then can be fed into different applications. Now this project was a collaboration with a number of engineering companies and academia. So included Earth Daily, as I mentioned, Hatfield consultants who worked on looking at burn scar analysis, comparing before and after fires in 2021, BGC and Clario. So working on the augmented reality platform, which Keith will talk a bit more. So taking our earth observation data and being able to display it to end users in a, in a cool way. And then also Microsoft providing cloud services, University of Victoria doing research with Earth Daily and also BC Parks Foundation, uh, UVic was supporting them in looking at trying to measure carbon values on properties that BC Parks was trying to conserve. And then finally, we had Environment Climate Change Canada, who was also acting as a, almost like a consultant, like using all of their experience to give us feedback on how all these things were working. And then there was the government funders of MyTax and Digital Supercluster. So a very cool project. And you'll hear a bit more about the outputs of that project from Will coming up. Over to you, Will. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yes, so we just talked about how it's so expensive to work with all this data. So the obvious question that quickly comes up is why take so many images? Why downlink that much data a day? Why process that much data a day? And, and at the core of many challenges in working with Earth observation is that we're working with natural systems. And one, one key thing that gets in the way of optical imagery is clouds. And so if we're trying to understand and, mo and model change over time, especially over large areas, we're thinking, you know, the size of provinces, even countries, uh, or even sort of eco regions or watersheds, you tend to need more than just a single image to do it. And you, you tend to need even hundreds potentially, if you're trying to model that over medium to long term periods of time. And that's what our Earth Mosaic system does. It looks at deep stacks of temporal imagery. It characterizes and understands where the good and bad data within that stack is. And it builds an idealized composite image that represents a moment in time. In this example here on the left of the slide, you see that it's just trying to build a mosaic that represents summer 2020. And that's really at the core of what we're doing here with Earth Mosaics is to create this idealized cloud-free scientific quality measurement that is able to be fed directly into modeling type applications. And if you can do that well, you can start to understand how landscapes change in the medium and long term and even short term. This is really just dependent on the amount of data and therefore how short of a time scale you can use with a mosaic. And that can help you understand how 
individual lakes are changing, watersheds are changing. In this example here, this is looking at Shasta Lake in California, uh, a very, very commonly known uh, drought prone region, especially in the last handful of years, especially this year. Uh, and what this uh, video on, this, on the left here is just showing how, we can, how you can look at how that changes over time. And by building these within a mosaic construct, it allows you to also feed this over time into more sophisticated modeling approaches that allow you to understand not just are things changing in the landscape, but understanding the nature and degree of that change. And one example from this project is looking at fires. And so fires are a much smaller in scope and scale relative to the last pictures I just showed you, but they can be very big as we know in BC. And this example here is just showing that. These are some recent fires uh, that occurred, I believe, in the 2021 year. I could be wrong on the year. Uh, where you're looking at using the wavelengths we measure and building those in a composite and then trying to do a an clear understanding of what happened, what the state of the ecosystem was before a fire and what the state of the ecosystem was after a fire. And here's two examples in here using a normalized burn ratio as well as a burn area index. Each of these have different advantages depending on how long after a burn we're measuring. But what you can see quite clearly in the, in, in the middle graphic is just how visually uh, we can see quite well where these fires are. And then by using more sophisticated analysis, such as what is done by our friends at Hatfield, uh, you're able to understand not just the impact of fire, but the degree of impact of the fire. And this links directly back to things like geohazards because surface changes in landscape and land cover have a direct impact on geohazards and other features in the landscape. So understanding and characterizing change, both at sort of small scale all the way to large scale matters quite a bit because a changing, land, a changing landscape leads to changing risks. And this is what understanding fires is all about. This is what understanding various land cover and land change properties at scale is really about. But there's one more challenge, which is all of this data is very specialized. This is not a new challenge to most geoscience people. We become very skilled and knowledgeable in how to work with this specialized data, but not everyone does. And so one thing that this project really wanted to look deeper into was using uh, augmented reality as an operations and communication tool so that we, you can better understand and visualize for your own needs, as well as communicate that to stakeholders within various contexts. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Keith to talk about augmented reality. Hey everyone, thanks for that. Um, yeah, we uh, wanna talk a little bit about the augmented reality uh, aspect of this. And some of you uh, have heard different terms around this, uh, AR for augmented reality, VR for virtual reality, uh, MR for mixed reality, and they're all a little bit interchangeable in our talk today, but. Uh, we're going to look at how we can project, take the take the 3D data that everyone's using in an engineering context and get it off of the 2D screen and get it into the room where it can be interacted with in a, a more complete way as a three-dimensional hologram. Uh, so just wanted to start off with uh, just a discussion of what some of the issues that affect engineering projects uh, around, around this area. In the field, we find that 75% uh, of field engineers and operators are still recording their field observations in a more traditional way that's not particularly shareable or indexable. This results as a disconnect between the field and other spatial data being managed. Uh, things get sent off in emails, things get lost in Z drives and folders. Uh, and so there's a bit of an organizational aspect around this which can cause delays and cancellations that threaten projects uh, that cannot manage or if this effective stakeholder communication very well or this, this data sharing issue very well. And the big number here is we're seeing up to $88 billion waste annually in travel, coordination time, and we work due to the bad data or, or communication issues. So we wanna kind of find some ways that we can use uh, the power of this earth observation data that we're, we were seeing earlier uh, plus the localized data that comes from day-to-day -day field operations and bring those things together in a way that's more organized and, and better shared with a larger group of stakeholders, be that engineers or uh, the general public or, or governments or re review boards. So if you're looking at, at solutions to these problems, what would, what would those solutions include? 
Well, part of it would be, it would need to be multi-user. So you want an accessible platform that allows people to capture, organize, and share the uh, project observations and resolve those issues uh, in a multi-user context. And you also want to contain all of that data in a map-based workspace that combines the, the spatial database map, say, coming from your Earth observation with a variety of localized field observations that could include photos, notes, or, or, or local 3D scans. So it's bringing that macro uh, version of the project data with the micro version of the product data and organizing them together. And the other important piece, of course, is the ability to share that information with others. Uh, we, we hear this term metaverse bandied about a fair bit. Uh, you know, for us, we want to talk about metaverse for the real world. And what that means is uh, applicable technologies for, the, for virtual meetings and, and, and uh, the metaverse sharing of data uh, in a way that, that actually benefits uh, companies and projects moving forward. So how do we make that work? Uh, so just in, in, in a couple of steps, uh, we have the users start by creating a site-specific geospatial workspace around their project. And this can just start with something as simple as a, as a base map from public sources. Um, but from there, we want to drag and drop that real-world data uh, from, from the, the, the larger project. So that could be your Earth observation data, that could be from your GIS, that could be from a photogrammetry scan from a drone. But you want to basically build on that, that basic workspace with that spatial data. Uh, from there, you want to be able to have that automatically deployed to a variety of hardware platforms. So this is a game where we're talking about, is, is it your uh, preference to view this on the web? Is it your preference to view this on a mobile handheld device? Do you want to use uh, augmented reality headset or a virtual reality headset? Uh, and of course, the ability to share that, that data with others remotely and have that data intuitively accessible and understood by stakeholders. So not locked away in folders, not locked away in in communication threads, but accessible in a georeferenced way that ties to the actual project site. So we see a graphic here uh, that we have, you know, our cloud uh, in which we can bring together our, our GIS or spatial data, photogrammetry and LIDAR. We can also bring in CAD for, for, for structures that are going to be built on the site, uh, whether that be uh, dams or, or buildings or, or what have you. And we can also incorporate subsurface data, which is kind of the other side of the coin as it relates uh, to this Earth's observation data, is that we can also include uh, borehole, uh, seismic, and, and other data types that are collected from, from the subsurface as well. So we're bringing together all of these different types together in one presentation. So this is all about democratizing that data and making it uh, accessible through immersive experiences. So again, we're, we're talking about that macro view, the Earth, Earth observation data, and then also tying in, in a georeferenced way, the on-site conditions. Uh, we want to bring that spatial and 3D data off the screen and into the real world, bring it into the room where it can be interacted with. In the case of the localized scans, uh, up to a one-to-one -one scale, uh, but also with the Earth observation data in, in tabletops or, or even uh, room or, or gymnasium filling experiences where people can interact with it at that scale. And one of the things that we want to do with uh, our engineering partners is build uh, a shared common operational understanding of a project. So engineers are really good at, at looking at, uh, at two-dimensional data, looking at 2D screens of data and, and building a 3D visualization of that in their mind. But uh, what we have is sometimes we have some disparity between different, uh, different viewers and, and their versions of, uh, of what they're looking at. So by using this holographic technology, we can really get to that, that shared common operational understanding much faster uh, than we have before. The ability to walk through that data to gain new perspectives uh, and also gain a better understanding of the project scope and scale. And really what we want to try and do here is solve project issues, move projects forward in a way uh, that, that minimizes travel, minimizes delays. Obviously, when we're looking at some of, some of these projects and some of the satellite data, the reason that we are we're using satellites is because they're very far flung and remote. So if we can trim off that travel time and yet get projects solved by bringing the, ex the site to the expert as opposed to the other way around, we can really take advantage of the, the return on investment. So some of the views that we see here uh, of our product solution, uh, you see that we have on, on the left here, we have a map-based interface 
where we are uh, bringing in a, a large scale map uh, that has had some uh, work done in the GIS package to kind of give some, some uh, overlays to show some of the engineering work that's been done. And then you see kind of a, a pin coming through the middle of that, which we call a point of interest. And that pin contains a variety of observations that, that were taken at site. And those could be photos, those could be text notes, sketches, and they can also be 3D scans uh, that are taken locally as well. On the right hand side, we see that we have the ability to bring in a variety of different data types. So we see we have the, the GIS and CAD on the surface. And then in the subsurface, we're bringing in uh, boreholes, we're, bringing, we're showing an ore body, uh, the large green blob there. And the, the colorful rainbow is, is some seismic data from, from the subsurface observations. Uh, as, again, when you're now that you've built that workspace, now your workers in the field, they can start adding layers of, uh, of up to date and up to the minute information to that. Again, they can, they can take a photo and attach that as a pin to the map. Uh, they can upload a scan. Uh, create a scan from their handheld device, add notes and add sketches and that sort of thing. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, we see that we have the ability to tag that data to add some, some more com um, uh, reference to it. Uh, we can add comments to it and we can also add tasks. So this is now giving a day-to-day a, a -day life to that larger uh, earth observation ob information. We are now adding uh, localized up to the minute uh, observations to that and we're able to assign tasks. So we can give other people in our teams uh, the, the tasks that, that they require, that they can actually look at the latest information that's being brought to them by the app, and they can see exactly where those issues were pinned on the map, and they can then complete their tasks and do their additional observations uh, based on, on that map-based interface, all while staying in the same organizational construct. So when it comes to the 3D scans, uh, again, we're talking about now going from the macro down to the local, and we can take scans of issues that are happening in the field, and we can compare things and to see how they've changed over time. Have conditions deteriorated? Have they uh, have, have things been fixed that were supposed to be fixed? Um, and so that's an important piece uh, involved in this. And on the right hand side, we see the other piece that is actually kind of a critical component, which is that remote virtual meetings. So now we can actually gather people around in the 3D virtual space around this Earth observation data, around the localized uh, created 3D scans and observations. And we can actually share that in a virtual meeting. So we see here we've got uh, this is a project that we did. Uh, um, with the federal highways in the U.S. and Denali National Park in Alaska. We see we have a variety of engineers that are viewing this from a variety of locations around North America. None of them actually had to travel to Alaska for this meeting. And they're able to view the, the large scale and small scale uh, 3D uh, representations of the site in a way that they were able, actually able to uh, continue with their designs and make approvals and move the project forward. And so every person is represented kind of by a floating uh, headset as you see there in the image. And uh, you see the sort of lasers to indicate what people are pointing at. And they are also uh, having a conversation through the app as well. So that, that combination of, of, uh, of capture, bring all of the data, all of the information together under one georeference workspace, the organization, the ability to bring local and uh, macro data together in one place and sharing that ability to share all of that data, all of that information all of that data on all of those observations with other people in a variety of locations is kind of uh, the solution that we, that we bring to to uh, to this question so even you're looking for a system like this there's some desired advantages that you want to look for and some things that we'd like to think that uh, that we're that we're doing a good job on obviously speed of processing this needs to be a data-driven workflow. What I mean by that is instead of sending your information, sending your data off to a third party for processing in order for it to become a holographic representation, it's something you can do in-house by literally dragging and dropping your data from your current workflow into a tool that will automatically turn into the, the shareable 3D holograms. So that's an important uh, aspect. You want clarity and visual fidelity, obviously, 
uh, engineering data needs to be rendered at a high high quality and high clarity in order for the decisions to be made and, and for uh, engineering design uh, to continue. You want stability of that re data reproduction. So we use what are called spatial anchors and georeference data. That means that when you're viewing that, it is anchored in the room. It's not floating around. It's not jumping around. And when you're sharing that with other people, they are all seeing the exact same thing in the exact same place. This all leads to higher confidence. So whatever your project stakeholders, whether that be other engineers, whether that be regulators, government, or even the general public, they can more easily understand the scope and scale of projects to make better decisions moving forward. So these are some of the things that we want to do by, by taking the earth observation data uh, that are so critical to the projects that our clients work with, and then also bringing in the localized data and presenting it all as a three-dimensional holographic view, uh, gets it off of that screen and gets it into the room for people to share virtually. So as a result, we're looking at some of those problems at the earlier part. We have some advantages that we can apply here, some KPIs. Uh, we can reduce rework on projects by up to 50% uh, by making sure that issues are solved in a timely manner on site without extra travel or without delay. We can reduce that site travel by up to 75% for those specialized experts that may, may not be on site when the problems arise. And we can recapture 30% of the leader's time in any particular project uh, that were previously lost to communication and coordination issues that no longer are required by constantly revisiting uh, project data, constantly revisiting in meetings to make sure that everyone's got that operational understanding that we can now achieve much more quickly. So to that end, I want to just look at a couple of case studies uh, that are sort of real world applications uh, of this technology. Uh, that we've been lucky enough to work on in the last little while that, that uh, apply some of these, uh, these ideas. Um, one of them is with uh, uh, Caltrans in uh, California. Uh, they are currently doing a, a fairly major road realignment of Highway 101 in Northern California near the Oregon border. If you've been up to that part of the world, you'll know two things. One, it's a very beautiful part of the world with the ocean uh, view on the highway. And two, that that section of the highway is slowly sliding into the Pacific Ocean. So to mitigate against that, uh, Caltrans is doing a $30 million assessment for public input uh, for the realignment of Highway 101. And what we're doing is instead of just showing them topographical maps or showing them uh, flat two-dimensional maps, we're actually using uh, the, uh, the HoloLens technology. And I've got one here, just if you're fam not familiar with that. Uh, the HoloLens is actually a, a mixed reality or augmented reality headset that that actually you can see the, you're not cut off like VR, you can actually see the rest of the people in the room around you, but it projects the 3D hologram of the data into the space around you. So we're using this technology in the, in the public uh, meetings and also with the engineers as a way to show the complexity of the options and choices in a way that all the stakeholders can understand. So realigning that highway involves some hard choices, uh, either a, a long detour uh, that adds a lot of time to the journey or a tunnel but that costs billions of dollars or a shorter route but that would involve cutting down uh, precious redwood uh, forest trees so these are all difficult choices and and using this technology we can get to a place where people have a better understanding of the uh, engineering impacts uh, and can make um, informed decisions on how to move these projects uh, forward and keep this assessment project from stalling Here's some images from that. Uh, on the left-hand side, you actually see, uh, here's the public meeting in the local hall. Uh, there's our hall lenses all ready to go. So after the uh, sort of standard PowerPoint presentation, we give everyone there a chance to actually view this data uh, as a 3D hologram uh, through, the, through the hall lenses that we had set up for them. And on the right-hand side, we see an example of one of those tabletop maps using that, that uh, large-scale uh, earth observation data with the uh, uh, the GIS overlays uh, to explain some of the uh, some of the issues going on with that project. Um, Giant Mine, uh, if you're familiar, uh, in uh, in Yellowknife Northwest Territories, there's a former gold mine uh, from of about 70 years, uh, done in the bad old days of mining, mining before environmental controls were in place, as we do have them now. Uh, that has resulted in a one billion dollar Canadian government uh, project to mitigate the risks of 
arsenic trioxide that was left over from that gold mining operation that uh, is, could potentially impact the town of uh, 20,000 people plus the surrounding First Nations uh, in the area. So this is a, you know, a highly emotionally charged project because a lot of people live in and about an area that, that could potentially have, have uh, health and, and other safety impacts from the, from the, the gold mine operation uh, that's since shut down. It's a large uh, government investment. Uh, as Canadians, we all own a piece of this through our, our tax dollars. So what we've done in this case is we've actually used uh, a variety of different data types uh, to create an application. You can actually uh, download and check this out yourself if you'd like. Uh, you can actually go to uh, the Google Play Store for Android or the uh, Apple iOS Store uh, for Apple uh, and just search Giant Mine. You can download and check out the app. But it actually takes you underground, shows you the mine underground in, is, as a 3D AR projection through your device. Uh, and shows you the issues that, that are happening and also gives you an understanding of the engineering solution. And then it ends with a series of 360 degree, what we call immersive scenes. And these depict the landscape uh, in the future, 20 years from now, after the uh, mitigation has taken place. So we see here on the right hand side, here's an example of we're showing in the underground exactly what the mining operation looks like. Uh, a little hard to see in this small thing, but if you download the app and check it out, you'll see it in better detail. But there's kind of a small blue halo in the middle of the screen there. That's the engineering solution where they're going to freeze the arsenic in place. And on the left hand side here is an example of the 360 degree view where you're literally standing on a deck. And as you move around, you see the creeks have been returned. The wildlife has been returned. The trees have been returned to the, to, to the mitigated site. So this gives people a great deal of peace of mind that this project is being managed correctly, that there is a bright future for this project and that, uh, that, that is not, not the uh, existential concern uh, um, moving forward that, that has been in the past. Finally, another case study, uh, I wanna talk about uh, Denali in Alaska. Uh, so uh, the, there's a road that connects uh, east and west Alaska through the Denali National Park that has been prone to landslides. So they're now building a bridge to bypass the landslide area. This was during the height of COVID, so think last summer, uh, and we needed eight engineers to meet uh, from around North America to actually uh, study and review the site conditions to make engineering decisions and move the project forward. That was diff it's difficult at, at the best of times to do this uh, during, uh, during any time, but during COVID it was actually impossible. So again, we sent the, uh, the HoloLenses out to these engineers around North America. We saw that screenshot from earlier where they were actually able to um, uh, join a virtual meeting. And uh, from there, they were actually able to view the spatial data uh, as uh, on the macro scale, but they were also able to, to view the, uh, the engineering solution in a one-to-one -one scale. And so they were able to actually able to fill their, their, their own personal office or home space with the bridge and actually walk on the bridge and see that, what that was going to look like. And again, here we see on the left-hand side, we have sort of a large-scale uh, map showing the, uh, the, the, the larger project area. And on the right-hand side, another example here of the actual virtual meeting that took place. So we see the, the uh, HoloLenses floating, uh, those that represent the different engineers. The hands indicate what they're pointing at. They're actually talking with each other. They're able to actually take measurements, uh, do annotations, uh, and bring highlights to different aspects of the map so they can actually work on that in a virtual space and, uh, and take advantage of that. Um, so that's kind of uh, my time in terms of explaining how we can bring uh, this, this larger scale data into a, a 3D virtual context and some of the case studies that we've used around that. I'm going to pass it back to uh, Matt to wrap up. Thank you very much, Keith. And just to recap our learning objectives, as uh, Will and Keith have both went over some really cool topics, um, you should now have a better understanding of the different remote sensing data types, um, understand some of the benefits of using large area composites and how EO products can be used to monitor environmental changes. And also have an understanding of cloud-based advanced data processing techniques and some of the challenges there around costs and finally, how do you communicate that data in an augmented reality environment? 
So thank you everybody for attending our presentation. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself, Will or Keith, and we'll be happy to answer. And you can still use the Q&A for a few more seconds and please fill out the survey that's gonna pop up in a second. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our 2022 annual conference. My name is Heidi Yang, and I am the CEO of Engineers and Geoscientists BC. I would like to begin by acknowledging the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, and in particular, the Squamish, Salatooth, and Musqueam peoples where I'm joining from today. As our professions continue to evolve, it is important for us as engineers and geoscientists to continue to learn and grow and to uphold our professional responsibilities to the people of British Columbia. Our annual conference provides our registrants with an important opportunity to connect, learn from each other, and develop our professional skills and practices. I hope you had the opportunity to attend some of the conference's continuing education sessions, to listen to the insightful keynote presentations, and network with your peers. As this year's conference comes to a close, I would like to thank all of our conference sponsors with a special thanks to our keynote sponsors, Park and Northbridge Insurance and UBC Master of Engineering Leadership. Without their generous support, we would not be able to put on such a high quality program. I would also like to thank Anna Maria Tremonti and Winique Horn Miller for their wonderful keynote presentations and all the conference presenters for joining us and sharing their knowledge. Finally, thank you to our dedicated team of volunteers and staff whose planning and organizational efforts ensured such a wonderful event. I hope that you have enjoyed the 2022 annual conference. Please join us for networking opportunities in the virtual lounge and enjoy the rest of your day.